Grace, mercy and peace be with all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. The text for our sermon for this Palm Sunday is our Gospel reading for today from Luke chapter 19. And in particular we are going to be focusing on how Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem as he rode into the city on that day. But before we look at that, I first want to share with you a very cheerful thought, or at least something that I think is a very cheerful thought, and that is that COVID-19 is a judgment of God. I'm guessing that when I say that, most of you don't instantly think of that as a cheerful thought, but I hope to convince you by the end of this sermon that this is one of the most cheerful things that we can think at this time. When I say that COVID-19 is a judgment of God, I'm guessing that most people will race to deny it. Of course, atheists will deny it because they don't even believe that there is a God. But many Christians will deny it as well and say, oh, no, no, God has nothing to do with this. This is just a result of chance or the blind forces of nature. And they will say that because they don't want God to get the blame and they want to get him off the hook. But the reality is we don't need to get God off the hook. He doesn't want to get off the hook. And if we are going to say that God has nothing to do with this, in effect, we are saying that he is not the almighty creator of all, who is sovereign over all of things in our natural world, so that nothing happens that he does not permit. The Bible makes it very clear that he is sovereign over all things. And furthermore, it makes it very clear that sickness and death are God's judgment on us human beings because of our sin. Sometimes we can make a very specific connection between a specific sin and a specific judgment of God. And we see this with some of the plagues in the Bible. For instance, the plagues that God brought on Egypt at the time of the Exodus were part of his judgment on Pharaoh and on his people for their hardness of heart. Likewise, later on in Israel's history, God brought plagues on the people of Israel and he sent his prophets in advance to tell them that because of specific sins that they had committed and their refusal to repent, this judgment was now going to come upon them. But in most instances, we do not have a prophet of God to reveal this kind of information to us. And so it's not possible for us to match up specific sins with specific judgments. But what we can always say is that because we are all sinners, eventually sickness and death comes to us all. Now, when I say this, I want to make it very clear that I'm not trying to point the finger at anyone in particular. Jesus warns us against that kind of self-righteous finger pointing. Remember what Jesus said when he was discussing that incident of the tower, in, uh, tower of Siloam in Jerusalem, which collapsed and killed 18 people. And he asked the question, do you think that these people were worse sinners than everybody else living in Jerusalem at the time? And then he answers his own question by saying, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now note that Jesus is not saying that this incident was not a judgment of God on these people. But instead, he was saying that this incident should stand as a warning to us all. He's saying to us that we can't single them out as if they, are, they were worse than everybody else, but instead judgment is coming for us all. And the only way that any of us can be spared is if we repent. And yet this thought that judgment is coming for us all is not something that should make us fearful, at least not for us Christians. But instead it is something that should make us cheerful. We see that in the, the Psalms, the judgment of God is seen as a cause for rejoicing and celebration. So now I want to reflect on four reasons why it is a very cheerful thought, something that should cause us to rejoice and celebrate, to think that COVID-19 
is a judgment of God. The first reason why this is a cheerful thought is that God's judgments are just. God does not judge us human beings because he has a bad temper or because he enjoys smiting people. Instead, the only reason why he judges is because he is just and because he wants to right the wrongs of the world. He wants to put a stop to human tyranny and evil and he wants to re-establish his good order. And what is more, God's judgments always fit the crime. What is the natural and just consequence of us human beings rebelling against the God who is the giver of all life and treating him as if he is irrelevant? Well, the natural and just consequence of this is that we would be robbed of life and that we would die. Or what is the natural consequence of us puny human beings trusting in ourselves instead of in the Lord and treating him as if he is irrelevant and telling him to get out of our lives? Well, the natural consequence is that he would get out of our lives and that we would then be faced with all kinds of situations that we cannot handle. And this describes our society to a T. Right? The fundamental assumption of Australian society today and, and of well, every other Western society as well is that there must be a human solution to every problem and that God is superfluous to requirements. Yes, we still enjoy freedom of religion and people will say, okay, it's fine if you want to worship God and if that suits your personal preferences. But nevertheless, he's treated us completely irrelevant when it comes to day to day life here in this world. And this is not just true for unbelievers. Instead, this kind of thinking infests us all. Even as Christians, we are tempted again and again to live like practical atheists, and to worship God on Sunday, but then to live as if he doesn't exist for the rest of the week. We live like practical atheists every time we fail to lean on the Lord in prayer and start trusting in ourselves and in the strength of our own arms and in our own hard work and ingenuity to solve all of the day-to-day -day problems that we face instead of trusting above all in the provision of the Lord. We live like practical atheists whenever we neglect the word of the Lord and follow our own human wisdom instead as if we are cleverer than God and we don't really need to listen to him. And we live like practical atheists whenever we seek to justify ourselves. Whenever we make excuses for our sins and point the finger and pass the buck or maybe try to say that the evil things that we do are really good instead of confessing our sins and confessing the sinfulness of our sins and then living by the abundant grace of God every day. Allowing Christ alone to justify us. So what does God end up doing when we choose to trust in ourselves in this way instead of trusting in him? Well, eventually he says to us, okay, if that's how you want it, I'll get out of your lives and we can find out how you do on your own with coping with things that are too big for you to handle. Things like COVID-19. And how are we doing in this situation? Well, I would say that the panicked overreaction is truly something to behold. Now, it is true that none of us know exactly how deadly this virus is going to prove to be long term. But most experts are saying right now that of all the people who end up getting infected, it's going to be less than 1% who actually die from it. So the vast, vast majority of people are going to pull through just fine. Now, that is not to say that we should not be concerned, um, particularly for elderly people or for people with pre-existing conditions amongst whom the death rate is likely to be much higher. But nevertheless, we are not talking about some kind of catastrophic civilization of ending event, at least not in and of itself. 
And yet from the reaction that we're seeing, you, you could almost be forgiven for thinking that we've been hit by the bubonic plague or something. Which shows just how fearful of death we really are. And in our fear, who are we turning to? We're turning to ourselves. We're turning to all kinds of human solutions. We have no cure. We have no vaccine. We know that we cannot stop this virus, at least not at this stage, and that the best that we can do is slow it down a little bit, hoping that eventually some kind of a cure is going to materialise. And yet for that, right, just to slow it down a little bit, we are willing to mortgage our children's futures. We are willing to put countless people out of work. We are willing to give up many of our freedoms, right? The freedom to associate with other people and to give them a hug, the freedom to go to church and so on. And we're willing to put most of our population under virtual house arrest. We are willing to disrupt our social fabric and to impose a police state and we are willing to risk a global economic meltdown. Now, at this point, it's worth saying that a global economic meltdown isn't just about money. It's also about lives. Because if the global economy melts down, you will end up with millions of people dying from other things. right? From things like suicide and depression in the Western world. And from things like hunger and malnutrition and lack of access to medical care and shortened life expectancies in the developing world. Now at this point I don't want you to get me wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take reasonable precautions or use the gifts that God has given us such as the gift of medical care and so on to try and save as many lives as we can. But what I am saying is that we need a little bit of perspective. The fact that we are willing to sacrifice so much and risk so much for the sake of such uncertain gain, to even risk the cure being worse than the disease, shows just how desperately we cling to the belief that we human beings can fix it. And what is this belief if not idolatry? Right? This is this belief is acting exactly like all idolatrous beliefs do. Right? It's sucking us dry while returning, giving us very little in return. And in fact, like all idolatrous beliefs, it is guaranteed to let us down in the end. Because no matter how much we try to stave off death, in the end, death is going to come to us all. And what are we not doing in this situation? At least not to any great extent. What we are not doing is turning to the Lord in prayer. Yes, it's true that many individuals are praying, including our Prime Minister, and I thank God for that. But our society as a whole is not praying. Our media is not calling for prayers. Our government is not calling for prayers. And in fact, we closed our churches even before we closed our brothels, right? Our churches are closed, but our dry cleaners are open, right? In fact, we're saying that it's more important for us to have pressed suits so that we look nice than it is for us to have the bread of life, right? Our churches have been declared to be non-essential. So what Jesus declares to be the one thing needful, we have declared to be unnecessary. And when I say this, I'm not pointing this finger at the unbelievers out there because, in fact, it was the churches who led the way. Most of them closed before they were required to do so by the secular authorities. A couple of Sundays ago, I was on holidays in Cloundra. At that stage, the churches were still allowed to be opened. Uh, open, but do you think I could find a single church that was willing to admit me so that I could pray and receive the body and blood of our Lord and hear the good news? Absolutely, I could not. And so if we're going to lead the way in declaring the word of the Lord and the bread of life to be inessential, then God is just if he allows us to just flail around with our mounting problems. Right? This COVID-19, this is not just us 
coming up against the random forces of nature. This is a just judgment of God who is currently humbling us because of our idolatrous trust in ourselves. But the judgments of God are not only just, his judgments are also merciful. And this is the next great reason why we should be cheerful about the thought that COVID-19 is a judgment of God. As Psalm 103 tells us, our Lord does not deal with us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities, but he is quick to show mercy to us instead. At the very end of the book of Samuel, we read about an occasion on which King David sinned against the Lord. And on this occasion, God sent the prophet Gad to David to say to him, OK, because you've sinned in this way, what judgment do you want me to bring upon you? Do you want three years of famine or do you want three months of fleeing before your enemies? Or do you want three days of plague? And in response to this, King David said, I'm in great distress. But let us fall into the hands of the Lord because his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So what happened? God sent a plague. But before the plague had run its course, he showed mercy on his people and brought the plague to an end. I think it's a very cheerful thought to think that this is a judgment of God because I would much rather fall into the hands of our merciful Lord than to fall into the hands of human beings or to, or to fall into the hands of the blind, uncaring, pitiless forces of nature. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And why was he riding into Jerusalem? Because he was determined to go to the cross. He knew that judgment was coming on the world because of its sins. And in this situation, he wanted to supply mercy. He wanted to go to the cross so that he could take all of our judgment onto himself. So that he could pay the price for our sins. So that all of those who repent and look to him, might be forgiven and might be spared from the eternal consequences of our sins. This leads us to the third reason why we should be cheerful that the coronavirus is a judgment of God, and that is that God always judges out of love. On that Palm Sunday, as Jesus was travelling into the city of Jerusalem, and he got to the crest of the Mount of Olives, where he could see the great city of Jerusalem spread out before him. What did Jesus do? He broke down and wept. He wept because he knew that he had to speak words of judgment over this city because of its rejection of him and because of its refusal to repent and believe. He knew that because this city had rejected its promised Messiah, and the saviour that God had sent, that ultimately disaster was going to come upon uh, this city and upon this nation. But this brought him no joy. And instead, as he spoke these words of judgment, the tears were rolling down his face because he loved these people. As a, judge, uh, as a just God, he has to judge human sin. He does this for a couple of reasons. One is to discipline us so that we would wise up, so that we would see the consequences of our actions and change our ways. But this is the same thing that any wise parent does with their children, right? Enables their children to experience the harsh consequences of their own actions so that they learn better, right? So that they don't turn into spoiled brats and turn up in, turn out into mature adults instead. And then with those people who absolutely refuse to wise up, who absolutely refuse to repent, and are determined to continue on down that path of evil, 
eventually he has to destroy such people so that the rest of the world that he loves can be spared. And yet when he has to destroy anyone, this brings him no joy at all. Instead, it's something that he does with tears running down his face. As we read in the book of Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Right, that is the heart of our God. And this then leads us to the final reason why it is a cheerful thought that the coronavirus is a judgment of God, and that is that our God always judges to save. Right, because this is what is in his heart, because he wants to save us, not to destroy us. He always uses his judgments to bring salvation. God uses his judgments to get us to wake up, to get us to see the error of our ways, to get us to see the consequences of our sins so that we turn back before it's too late, so that we would repent and be saved before we ever have to experience the ultimate and eternal consequences of our sins. And when we turn back to him, he delights in helping us and saving us. When our idols fail us, as they will inevitably do, so that we start to sink and we start to drown, so that in our distress we finally turn to him, he is then quit to give us his help and his salvation. And this is what is always his ultimate goal. As we heard in our gospel reading for today, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He did not come to destroy us, but to save us instead, no matter how lost we may be. He came to save lost people like Zacchaeus, and like you, and like me. And so COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to focus on what is truly important in life, to focus on the one thing that is needful, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He is the one who is going to ultimately save us from this epidemic, whether it's by providing us with a medical cure or whether he simply uses his almighty power to bring an end to this pandemic. And he is the only one who will save us from the death that ultimately comes to us all by raising us from the dead and giving us new and everlasting life. So what's the worst that can happen to us if we have him as our saviour? That we die and go to heaven? Well, that's not so bad. So why would we be distressed or afraid? Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.